Hey, Lee, welcome to LSAT Unplugged. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining. So I was really excited to speak with you because you are one of the queens of law school prep. <laughs> and my audience is always looking to for what they can do to get ahead. Even before they even start prepping for the LSAT, they're like, well, what should I read for law school? What should I do now, the summer before, right. one else semester? Wherever you want to take it, let's just dive right in. Sounds good. This, I talk about this all day. I have plenty to say. <laughs> Great. All right. So let's say someone has just submitted their applications to law school yeah. and they've got six months to even a year before they're starting 1L. What could they be doing now? What could they be thinking about now? Well, I think there are a few things that they could be thinking about, um, but maybe the best thing is what they shouldn't be thinking about. So you don't need to be trying to learn all of the law that you're going to learn in law school. And I think that a lot of people think that you need to study law before you get into law school. This can be reading things called horn books or reading what they call supplements in law school that kind of talk about the law. Um, some people even go so far as to take prep courses that do lectures on the law. I don't think it's a bad idea to understand kind of the universe of the law, but you're going to law school to learn the law as presented to you by your professors. And so there's no need to do that outside of law school. What I think is better to think about is if you want to work on your skills um, that you'll use in law school. So that might be how you read, maybe working on your reading speed. Let's say you're someone who really struggles at reading. Well, it might be a good idea to spend some time practicing reading challenging things <laughs> because cases are challenging. They're oftentimes in um, the beginning of your 1L year, you read a lot of cases that are even in kind of archaic language. Um, nobody enjoys reading. <coughs> Excuse me, nobody enjoys reading cases like uh, Panoyer versus Neff or things that are in Old English. Um, so you can kind of practice reading kind of dense material um, and seeing how you retain information. I also think working on your time management skills, your life skills, um, how you deal with challenge, your mindset, like all of these kind of skills to go into law school um, are going to benefit you because studying law is hard, but law school is hard for a lot of different reasons. The workload, the the topic area, and just the lifestyle of being a, a law student and eventually a lawyer. So working on kind of all of this stuff um, is really, I think, what you want to be thinking about. And maybe take some trips and have some fun and go sit on the beach or do something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I think that definitely people do need to relax. They can't do nothing but prep every single second. No. But for those who want to read difficult material, and obviously nothing in old English necessarily... <laughs> I mean, if that's what? your jam, yeah. I, mean, I don't want to discourage you, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But let's say somebody wants to read something difficult. What specifically might you suggest for them to read? And how do they know if they're actually understanding what they're reading? That's a really good question. You know, I think that you can kind of pick anything. I mean, I even think a dense novel would be something great. You know, just something that you can't fly through. You know, my, um, I think all of us, you know, like to do easy reads, right? Where you're like, oh, I'm kind of like skimming the page. I'm getting the gist, you know? I mean, I know it's almost Game of Thrones time. Um, some Game of Thrones might've come back out by the time this podcast is, um, is, is on. But I think, you know, even like something like Game of Thrones, like complicated names, or you're trying to follow complicated stories, like anything that kind of challenges you and stops you from speed reading, like you might do with a novel or a blog post. I think one of the things about our current environment with social media, with email, with all of our electronic communications is we oftentimes are either multitasking when we read or we are skimming. I mean, I skim all day long. Not, not anything important. Don't tell my team. But, you know, I mean, we all, we skim the news and things like that. So it can be hard to try and um, to focus on just sitting down to read, maybe on actual paper. You could go and like do something crazy, like buy a real book and maybe even take notes or mark up notes. I have two little kids and I was literally, I was so geeking out this week because I'm reading this parenting book on discipline, which is what, this is what life becomes when you start to have kids and like do other things. And so I was reading this book and I full on had my marker out and I was like taking notes in the margins, like a law student. Cause I'm like, I need to retain this information. I was like, name it to tame it, you know? 
best I can like, yeah. remember. So I think it can be really anything. Um, but you want to just get into this idea that you can sit in one place and do something focused. And then maybe you can even challenge yourself to tell a friend or your partner or even your dog, if you don't have anyone in your house, what you read about. Because I think that that idea of taking in information and then processing it and then saying it back is very challenging sometimes. And sometimes I think we don't even appreciate that we're not retaining what we read. Another example of this is um, I've been listening. I have, a, I have one of my kids is a baby. So I do a lot of like walking around with the baby because I, I live in San Francisco. And uh, so I've been listening to audiobooks, which makes me feel like a 60 year old lady walking around listening to my audiobook, but it's like the only way I get to like read <laughs> right now. Um, and I was listening to a book um, by this um, behavioral psychologist that I thought was just fascinating. And I was, came home to explain to my husband what I had heard, but I am not an auditory learner. And so terminology and retention of new words and new phrases is very hard for me if I don't see it. So I could barely explain. I was like, I read this or I listened to this book. It was amazing. So there's a part of your brain like over here, I can't remember what it's called, you know, and he was just laughing at me. But I realized, you know, from a study perspective, if I was in law school, that would have been a great sign that I shouldn't just be listening to lectures, because I wouldn't be able to retain that information. So kind of just being aware of how you are interacting with stuff, I think can be really powerful in getting you ready for the law school experience. That's such a great insight. Yeah, if you can't explain it to somebody else, then you may not have fully absorbed it. Yeah. And I can imagine auditory stuff if you're doing other things at the same time. Oh, yeah. It's easy to get distracted. So nothing, not for anything too dense necessarily. Right. I, I think that, you know, all of this stuff is just more about being aware of how you, um, you know, not only can absorb information, learn things, retain things, but also just how you react to being something being challenging. You know, it's humbling to do something or to read something that is not easy for you, right? I find some of the, I'm reading a lot about this, um, this kind of behavioral psychology and a lot about this neuroscience because I find it really interesting, the power we have over our brains, about how children have over their brains, about adults, how we can change ourselves. I'm totally nerding out. This is, I'm like, like three books, but I still, if you quiz me on a lot of the terminology, I would have a terrible time because it's not something I'm comfortable with, but I'm interested in it. So I'm going to keep trying. It's not my background. Um, and so doing something where you're not really good at it, learning about something new, taking a class that you're not good at, uh, take pottery. <laughs> my business partner once did a pottery class and talked about how humbling it was to take a pottery class. You know, um, if you've never done yoga before, try yoga. You might fall over, but there's a lot about your own mindset about learning to be comfortable falling over. Because I can guarantee you, no matter how brilliant you are, law school will humble you at some point. And it's all about how you have the right mindset and have the experience to deal with that failure and that being humbled by some sort of experience um, and how you get up and move on. And so that's the stuff you can practice even outside of like, how to take notes for class. You know, I mean, you know, we have a course called Start Law School Right, which is all about kind of studying. And we talk about the importance of, you know, mindset and how you, you know, plan your time and make sure you're taking care of yourself. But I think getting ready as a whole person for this law school experience is something really good that you can do, you know, for like a long-term year or so um, while you're waiting for your um, law school applications to go in. You can practice, you know, stress management <laughs> while you're waiting for things. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities to challenge yourself. So it sounds like what you're saying is that more important than actually learning the legal material is learning how to study properly. And then yes. also learning how to fail, learning to be humble. Yeah. Learn to stretch yourself. You know, if, um, you know, if you, you have to remember when you enter the law school system or, you know, that even if let's say you rocked it in undergrad, you were at the top of your class, you were amazing, you know, so you're like, I'm coming for you law school and you get to law school, but you also have to realize that like all those people who graduated from undergrad who enjoy school enough to go to graduate school. And they probably have similar skills than you do because they want to be lawyers and lawyers typically have a lot in common. Um, you're now part of a pool of people who have self-selected to take things like the LSAT and be successful at it, to, you know, want to spend three years of their life studying, which a lot of people do not want to do. And, um, 
And then it's kind of like, okay, all of a sudden people are like, whoa, I'm not a big fish. Everybody's a big fish. Now what do I do? And, and I think that you have to be okay with that and decide how you're going to approach the new challenges and failures. Not to mention the fact that law school set up to create these situations for some rockiness. You know, a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about the Socratic method. That's where they cold call you in class. If you've ever watched, you know, like the paper chase or read one L, I mean, that's all, you know, this old school idea, of, you know, calling on someone in the back of the room and they have to stand up. And this creates a lot of anxiety for people. And there's, you know, there's arguments about whether the Socratic method is the best way to teach. But the reality is, if you practice law, at some point, somebody is going to call on you, whether it be in a courtroom or in a client meeting, and you're going to have to come up with something to say, and you may not even be that comfortable with what you have to say, or you may feel like you're going to fail and sound really foolish, um, and then you have to figure out what to do with that. You know, and, and that's, that's just kind of the rite of passage. Like I have an embarrassing class experience. My business partner has embarrassing class experience. The only people who remember those experiences are us. Right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. No one else. I mean, none of my friends in law school are like, I remember that time Lee sounded like a total idiot mm -hmm. in criminal law. That was really like a turning point in her legal career. You know, nobody else is going to worry about that, but you. So what are you going to do with that? And are you going to let that become something that, um, you know, that causes more anxiety and makes it harder to study, things like that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Lee. So it sounds like you, you've you been through the process, you've been in the trenches, you know what it's like. You're, I can tell you're really speaking from experience about all of this. What was your law school journey like going through the process? Not only the, the embarrassing portions necessarily. Uh, I can always tell my embarrassing stories. <laughs> Maybe later if you want to. But okay, I mean, that's yeah. another podcast. Yeah. Leah yeah. the Law School Toolbox shares all of her embarrassing stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bloopers reel. Totally. <laughs> but even just what your journey starting from how you started off 1L semester. Yeah. Semester, what was it like for you and what did you learn along the way? Was a little bit older than some law students. I was 25 when I went back to law school. I had been working um, since undergrad. I was not sure I wanted to go to law school when I graduated from undergrad. My parents are lawyers. I swore up, down, and sideways I would never go to law school. Um, and so I kind of came at this journey that I wanted to go back to school and I didn't know what for. And I felt that law was somewhat flexible. And so I set these goals for myself. I'm like, if I can make myself study for the LSAT, then I must want to go to law school. So I like studied for and sat for the LSAT. And I was like, okay, now if I, I can make myself apply and write an essay that I must want to go to law school. <laughs> so I just kind of set these little intermittent goals. And then all of a sudden I'm like a one L and was like, I guess this is my next chapter in life. And so, um, and so I got to one L year and, you know, I think I did find it somewhat humbling because of this idea that you don't get a lot of feedback um, while you're in that 1L year. I think some law schools are better about this than others, but I didn't have any midterms. I didn't have you know, any feedback on any writing assignments. And so you know, you're just kind of studying, like, hoping you have it figured out. Now, I did have the benefit of going home over Thanksgiving while I was studying for my 1L exams. People have heard my podcast have probably heard this story where my mom, who is not subtle, um, sits down at the table and is like, so how's torts coming? It was my first test. And I was like, it's great. Like, I understand. I start to talk to her about it. It's this example of like, you have to be able to talk about what you know. And she's like, oh, that's very nice. So why don't you tell me the elements for XYZ? And I was like, well, I mean, I mean, I know like the gist and she was like, okay, here's a problem. I'm like, you have to know the elements for the test. Did you know that? And I was a psychology media study major in college. I had never had to memorize huge amounts of information like that for an exam. I'd never taken an exam that required that level of detailed memorization. And I thank her for that wake up call over Thanksgiving because I frantically kind of regrouped and started to recognize that I had a lot of work to do. And so I was able to somewhat regroup, but my first semester grades were not my most impressive uh, because I regrouped a little late in the game. Um, and that's just because it's so different. You know, that when we work with students in our one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs and in our Start Law School Write program, you know, we make sure that you understand what it's like to write an exam answer. 
because to understand the end game is very important. So I didn't understand the end game until I was really, you know, through the first semester. Then I was like, hey, I need to get my act together. So the second semester, I really kind of upped my game. I now understood the end game. I studied in a more productive way. I had better outlines. I did a lot more practice. And then all of a sudden, I'm you know, performing much better in my class, join the law review, um, start doing on-campus interviewing, get a big law job um, offer for my second semester summer, and then um, kind of continue through law school. I was the managing editor of the law review. Um, I did a tutoring in law school. And so I became very involved in producing not only great legal writing, which was what I was doing on the law review, in my opinion, but uh, helping people through. I was teaching assistant. I did one-on-one -on -one tutoring for students with academic, um, who were on academic probation. And so I really started to kind of get interested in how we do this process. So um, after graduation, I became a big firm lawyer, decided that was not my calling in life, um, and then shifted to start teaching and then eventually did this business. So that's kind of like my journey through law school, I guess, in a few minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. That's really something. So it sounds like the, that one comment from your mother about the elements was, was like this big wake-up call for you. It really was. It really was. And I just kind of frantically had to change gears. And I think that it's not that uncommon that people have to have some sort of wake-up call. I think that schools, some schools are being better about being very honest about what you need to do for these exams. Um, but I think that you can get so caught up in the day-to-day -day grind of law school, which is reading cases and briefing them and going to class and, you know, getting cold called on and sitting in your study group and, you know, arguing over hypotheticals and, you know, like kind of thinking outside the box that I think we can forget because you're not studying for, you know, intermittent exams like you would maybe in an undergrad class, that there's an end game. And the end game is they hand you a fact pattern most of the time, and you have to have all this law memorized then that you can recall and apply to that fact pattern. Because what thinking like a lawyer is, you hear this term a lot when you enter the like law school experience. You have to learn to think like a lawyer. Well, anyone can memorize elements, right? I mean, and just about anybody. <laughs> you don't have to go to law school to like memorize a list of things. What lawyers are taught to do is take that list and take a set of facts and apply those um, elements to the facts and be able to argue in the alternative when there are gray areas of ambiguity. That is what law school is really teaching you. So when you're in class and your professor is talking about what the plaintiffs argued and what the defendant argued and how one judge thought it should be this way, but the other judge wrote the dissent and thought it should be this way. This is ambiguity. This is the gray area. This is the fun stuff that makes the law interesting. But we don't really focus on that sometimes in law school. And what they're trying to test is, can you get a fact pattern and find that ambiguity, argue both sides and show that this knowledge of law can be applied to these facts? So I think what a lot of students do is they think, all I need to know is know the law. And that's wrong. Very interesting. And I, I love what you're saying about the, the mindset, the way of thinking, because so much of this, of course, translates over to my side of things with the LSAT. I can right. definitely see the parallels there. And I also like what you're saying about how people discuss the hypotheticals in their study groups, but something very different is actually necessary for the exams. Yeah. And I'm wondering about your experience tutoring the law in law school, and then, of course, the, the work that you do now as well. It sounds like what you do now may have grown up, been a natural outgrowth mm -hmm. of what you were already doing in law school, even while you were a law student. Yeah, I mean, ironically, I've been teaching people to take tests for a while. I was an SAT tutor in law school. Um, that was my part-time job. So, um, you know, I think I have, I find exams and studying for exams interesting. I don't know why. <laughs> Luckily, I found like other people who find it interesting who want to work with me. But, um, you know, I think that, that you do have to learn how to do this application part. And you, you know, it's, it is a little, the LSAT is such a different beast than some of the other exams because they're trying to test like reasoning and they're trying to noodle, needle in, and you can correct, you know much more about this than I do, but like needle into the areas that they think will make you good at the end game of this thinking like a lawyer. <laughs> you know, and, um, and so these fact patterns and, and things that you do in law school, um, you know, executing them 
you know, and being able to kind of think about them is one thing. And that's probably what happens in a study group. You know, you and I are in a study group together and we've just learned homicide in our criminal law class. And so we're sitting around and then, you know, we usually say, okay, well, what if the guy had a gun, but was like standing on his head and then there was a dog and he shot the dog and the bullet went through the dog and like hit a person, you know, what, what kind of, what kind of murder is that? You know, and so like, and which sounds crazy, but this is totally what law students end up doing because you keep, you know, you take all these crazy ideas and you're, and I, I totally did this, like walking around with friends, you know, you have like enough information to be totally dangerous, you know, I think. Yeah. Um, but what you have to do in an exam is you get a fact pattern. It could be wacky too. Law school exam fact patterns are typically pretty wacky, but you take that wacky fact pattern and you have to methodically do an analysis. You have to say, you know, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being with malice and a forethought. First degree murder, <laughs> you know, and you have to be like, why is this or not first degree murder. And you methodically have to go through it using um, a framework of writing called the IRAC, which is issue rule analysis conclusion, which is a formula for writing on legal exams. So what happens in your study group is everybody gets excited about the law and you might be debating things. But what happens on the exam is you have to be able to take all that debate you've done, make it very focused and answer the question asked by the professor using the fact pattern and then write it in this formula that law, that lawyers and law students and law professors, you know, all have to basically use that can be very foreign when people join the legal profession. I mean, I considered myself a good writer when I came to law school and my first legal writing um, assignment didn't go particularly well because I wasn't used to writing in this new formula and I had to change myself to meet this requirement. Now it's second nature, but it wasn't in the beginning. That's really interesting. So you have law school requires this regimented way of thinking and writing and analysis that people haven't necessarily ever done before. And then even within law school study groups, they might kind of go off the rails a little bit with crazy hypotheticals. And so I, I gather that what you're doing is kind of bring them back on track for what they need for the exams. Yeah. I mean, Hey, it can be fun to sit around and noodle on this stuff. But when you're working with other students in a group, you always have to be aware that you all have the same amount of knowledge. So, you know, if you're, if you're all noodling on an answer and you feel really confident about it, I would recommend if you're making a big decision on how some things should be handled, you go talk to a professor about it to get some feedback because you're still, you know, a first year law student. You know, you just because you've read some cases on homicide is totally different than really being an expert in it or understanding it. Um, I do not claim to be an expert on uh, homicide, but my dad was has been a criminal lawyer his whole life. He would be much more of an expert. So if I had questions about how things really function in the real world, I would talk to him. Um, you know, so I think it's also just appreciating where you are and getting the feedback and the help that you need. I think why students are interested in working with my team, which offers one-on-one -on -one individualized tutoring for law students, is that they can get some of that feedback and that dialogue from someone who has a bunch more knowledge within the safety of it's, we're not their professors. We're not grading their exams. We're not, you know, there's no silly questions for me. It's like a safe space. <laughs> and, you know, and we can answer the questions that you maybe feel embarrassed to ask we can also help you solve some of the issues that you might be having, you know, regarding time management, or maybe you're sitting in your study group and you feel like everyone's getting it, but you're not, then what do you do? You know, if you feel like you're working on outlines and they're not helping you answer your exam um, answers, what do you do? And that's kind of where I think we fill that gap is being your kind of person who can guide you through the rest of that experience to hopefully get you where you need to be. Cause we understand the end game even including the bar exam end game, which is a totally different beast than the law school end game. Well, it sounds like you're offering a great resource for law students. And this is the Start Law School Right course that you're referring to. So yeah, we have a few different offerings on the law school toolbox. Um, we, for pre-law students, so students who are kind of zero L's, you haven't necessarily started law school. We have something called Start Law School Right, which is an on-demand course uh, that walks you through kind of what, what we think is the universe of law school. So we read a case, we do a mock um, classroom Socratic method. So if you really want to like 
be entertained, my business partner. I think I'm the student. I think she gets to be the professor. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, you know, you can kind of, you follow along. We talk about taking notes. You take notes from that lecture and then you turn those notes into an outline. And again, we're using a small snippet of law, um, but then you turn those notes into an outline just like you would. And then um, we talk about something called attack plans, which are things that, um, help you organize the law in a way to apply it to an answer. And then we talk about this IRAC formula and then we have you write, do a writing assignment and, you know, then you can interact with our tutors and get feedback on that assignment. So it's somewhat on demand and it has an, as an um, interactive element as well. So you get some feedback with an individual tutor. So by the end, you've kind of done the universe, a little bit, a bite of the universe of what you'll do in an entire semester. And then when you start the semester, it won't be the first time you've read a case. It won't be the first time you know, you've done, you've listened to a Socratic dialogue, things like that. Our one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs are typically for students who are currently in law school um, and that we can support all varieties of courses and students throughout their law school experience, depending on when they want some assistance. So sometimes we'll have 1Ls who know that they have some, maybe some academic history that they're worried about. Maybe they have testing anxiety. Maybe they have, um, have struggled with performing on writing um, exams in the past. So they might want a coach to walk them through it, to give them all that feedback that they're not really getting in law school, to be more confident about the process. Um, and so we can work with students throughout their law school career as well. That all sounds enormously useful to get a, a dry run of what law school will be like when there aren't the same stakes involved, of course. And I, I really like that yeah. idea of the Socratic method dry run as well. That sounds like it would be enormously helpful to mitigate the stress. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of this is just kind of debunking the fear by giving you information about what you need to be doing and letting you have a, have a practice run that has no consequences. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. that's, that's the beauty. Like, you know, none of our stuff, like, will ever show up in your transcript. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Very nice. And you also have the Law School Two Box podcast, right? We do. So um, we are actually almost to our 200th episode, which oh, wow. is kind of hard to believe. Um, so we do have the Law School Toolbox podcast, which is hosted by my business partner, Allison Monahan and I. And we talk about a whole slew of things, obviously. Um, for 200 episodes, <laughs> almost 200 episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of information on there for um, students before they enter law school. So we talk about selecting the right law school for you, what to do over your summer. We just recorded an episode on you know, interesting books to read before you go to law school, um, how to memorize information. Like there's a bunch of information about getting ready for law school, how to move, how to set up your life. And then um, throughout about the law school academic experience, we have material on there for people about getting jobs and doing interviews. And we also just have stuff that we think is interesting. <laughs> so we interview people who are doing interesting things. Um, we have episodes on timely topics. I think one of the things about um, the world today is I think we are seeing, no matter what your political leanings, I think everyone can appreciate that lawyers um, are a very important uh, important function in what's going on in society right now. And so we've interviewed uh, lawyers who were at the airports when the first travel ban um, was put into place and were help, you know, lawyers just started showing up at the airports and talking about what was happening there. We've talked about um, with different lawyers who have been working in, you know, different areas of policy law. And I think it's, it's an interesting time in the midst of like considering to go to law school to realize that lawyers are having a real impact on what's happening in our world um, and that it's exciting. I mean, the law can be very powerful. You know, I, I geek out on the law school stuff, but like at its heart, I think it's a privilege to go to law school and it's a privilege to have a law license. And um, it's a good reminder for all of us, you know, that a lot can be done with that law license. Amazingly. Well, it sounds like you're offering every resource, a 0L or 1L or any law school student <laughs> could benefit from. So I'm really glad you're- We try. <laughs> This is great. So the Law School Toolbox podcast, the Start Law School Right course, mm -hmm. and then the website I'm guessing is lawschooltoolbox.com. Oh, it is. Awesome. Yes. I got it. Yes. <laughs> For the win. Excellent. <laughs>
<laughs> we also have a sister site um, called the Bar Exam Toolbox. If people are interested in uh, learning more about the Bar Exam or if they're worried about that in the future, we do have um, a parallel project we do called the Bar Exam Toolbox where we help people prepare for the California and UBE Bar Exams. Uh, and then we also have a newer uh, Bar Exam Toolbox podcast um, that people can also check out. Even if you're just curious about what the Bar Exam is, I think there's a lot of um, you know, just again, like kind of fear and an anxiousness around this thing, you know, that's out there. Bar results are falling. You might be on above the law reading about how the MBE rates have been the lowest that they've been in decades. I think that's some scary stuff. Some people might find it um, helpful to go and just listen, you know, to an episode where we walk through multiple choice questions on the bar. So you can just get an idea of what that is too. Um, because I think a lot of this is you, like the rest of the world, you have to control the noise and decide what you want to listen to, what you want to read and make sure that, you know, you're kind of staying true to yourself and, and staying focused on what's important to you. Excellent. Well, wow, you've even got the bar exam covered. So <laughs> we try <laughs> every step of the way. That's, that's amazing. Well, I'll definitely link to all of these resources in the description for this episode. Lee, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with our audience today. No problem. And, you know, as much as there's a lot of negativity around uh, law, law school and lawyers, I still believe that um, it's a really great experience to get to become a lawyer. And, you know, after you study for the LSAT, I think there's a lot you can do to get excited about joining the legal profession. Definitely. Well, it's an important profession. There's a lot of work that folks can do to make a difference. And it sounds like you're helping fuel them along the way. Now we're doing our best. Awesome. <laughs> the world that needs good lawyers. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. More than ever. Well, thank you again, Lee, for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.